Good afternoon, good morning, or good evening, depending on where you are joining us from today. Welcome to the webinar, Holding Sacred Space, Mental Health and Gun Violence, the fourth webinar in the series, Holding Sacred Space, Mental Health and Faith. My name is Amy Hong, and I serve as a Senior Executive Director of Education and Engagement at the General Board of Church and Society in Washington, D.C. For participants who are blind or low vision, or perhaps are only listening, I'm a Korean American woman with long black hair tied back wearing a gray shirt today. I will be moderating this webinar with my colleague, Reverend Kendall McBroom, for, who is the Director of Civil and Human Rights, and also with Toyomi Yoshida, who is our tech support. As we begin our webinar series, and as we have been in our previous webinars, we want to acknowledge that where the United Methodist Building is located in Washington, DC, is the traditional and ancestral homelands of the Anacostan people who have lived for generations neighboring the Piscataway and the Pamunkey peoples. We gratefully acknowledge and honor the Native peoples on whose ancestral homelands we gather today and the diverse Native communities who make their home here today as well. A short overview of our time together today. Um, after the presentation, there will be a time of Q&A and please enter your questions in the Q&A box located at the bottom of your screen. And after the Q&A, there will be a time with Reverend Kendall McBroom will be sharing ways that you can get involved legislatively to be an advocate for mental health. I am really excited and honored to introduce you to our speaker for today. Dr. Jeffrey Swanson is professor in psychiatry and behavioral sciences at Duke University School of Medicine. He is a faculty affiliate of the Wilson Center for Science and Justice at Duke Law School, the Center for Firearms Law at Duke Law School, and the Center for Child and Family Policy at Duke Stanford School of Public Policy. Dr. Swanson holds a PhD in sociology from Yale University. He is a social scientist researcher who collaborates across disciplines to build evidence for interventions, policies, and laws to improve outcomes for adults with serious mental illnesses in the community and to reduce firearm-related violence and suicide. He is an author of over 250 publications on subjects including the social environmental context of violence and mental illness, implementation of fire, state firearm restrictions related to mental health adjudications, effectiveness of involuntary outpatient commitment, and psychiatric advance directives. Dr. Swanson led the research group that published the first empirical evaluations of risk-based temporary firearm removal laws in Indiana and Connecticut, precursor to extreme risk protection orders order laws that were later adopted in many states. He received the 2020 Isaac Ray Award from the American Psychiatric Association and the American Academy of Psychi Psychiatry and Law for Outstanding Contributions to the Psychiatric Aspects of Jurisprudence. He received the 2011 Carl Taub Award from the American Public Health Association for Outstanding Contributions to Mental Health Services Research. He serves on the Executive Steering Committee on the Consortium for Risk-Based Firearm Policy. He previously served as a member of the John D. and Catherine T. MacArthur Foundation Research Network on Mandated Community Treatment and the Methods Core of the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation Public Health Law Research Program. 
He has delivered numerous endowed lectures, including the P. Browning Hoffman Memorial Lecture in Law and Psychiatry at the University of Virginia School of Law, and the Raymond W. Wagner Lecture on Ethics and Values in Medicine at the University of Michigan. Dr. Swanson frequently comments on gun violence in the national media and serves as a consultant to policymakers at the federal and state levels. I am so thankful um, that Dr. Swanson is here with us today, especially in the midst of all of his um, important research and work that he's currently doing right now. Thank you so much, Dr. Swanson. Thank you, Amy, and good afternoon, everyone. It's such a privilege for me to join you today in your uh, Holding Sacred Spaces webinar. I, um, I'm especially uh, pleased to be uh, speaking to a, a group of Methodists, and I'll tell you why, just very briefly. I'm not a Methodist, but Methodists are an important part of my family. My grandfather, uh, whose name was Reverend Charles Thomas Dillon, was a Methodist pastor in a little town called Winside, Nebraska in, in the early 1930s. And he died in 1933 in the middle of the Great Depression. My grandmother was left with six children and my mother was the second from the last. And everyone said that um, uh, my grandmother couldn't keep the family together and she'd have to you know, send the children to live elsewhere. And she was a godly woman who didn't believe that she should do that. And she talked to the bishop and asked whether uh, perhaps uh, they could come to an agreement because the bishop needed a pastor for the church. And my grandmother, who was, didn't ha have training as a clergy person, she hadn't been to seminary, um, but she was steeped in the scriptures and lived a godly life and was uh, someone who lived by personal piety and prayer. And um, she thought she could be a pastor herself. And that would solve the bishop's problem and solve her problem because she needed a job. So she wasn't trained as a pastor, but she had the benefit of being a saint. And so she took over and she was the pastor of that church for many, many years and other churches as well. And um, so I wanted to share that with you because what's interesting to me is that as, I, as far as I know, the Methodists didn't formally start to ordain women until, until the middle of the 1950s. So um, th my grandmother was a real pioneer and uh, she had an important influence in my life. I and uh, so I just thought I'd share that with you. Now to get on with, with our topic today, which is an important topic, I'm gonna share my screen so that you can see a few PowerPoint slides to illustrate this. And let's make sure that we have got this so that everyone can see it. So that the, the our topic today is gun violence, mental illness, and the law, balancing risk and rights for effective policy. So we're actually gonna talk about two important, complicated, but different public health problems that just come together on their edges. On the one hand, we have um, gun violence, firearm-related injury and mortality, uh, which is a real scourge in our country and it claims the lives of uh, 45,000 people every year, that's about 130 every day, who die in, uh, in, in firearm related injuries. And, it, it, and it's a problem that just uh, ripples through communities and, and uh, families across the generations. Um, on the other hand, we have the problem of uh, mental illness, people with serious mental illnesses like schizophrenia and uh, bipolar disorder that impair the brain's ability to to reason and perceive reality and regulate mood. We probably have 14 million people with serious mental illnesses in the United States and maybe a third of them are not getting treatment. And many of them end up in the criminal legal system, um, which I, you know, I think we have more people uh, in some of our big city jails today with serious and disabling mental illnesses than we ever had in the largest asylum in the middle of the 20th century. And that's really a, a scandal, I think. But the question is, what do those two problems have to do with each other? Uh, are they related to each other or not? Um, we often hear that they are when there's a horrifying mass casualty shooting and we're told that the perpetrator was mentally ill. We'll talk about that later. Um, but you know what we need to do, I think, is think about these problems separately um, so that we, we don't uh, conflate the two 
and try to find our way using research evidence to some solutions in a country like ours where we're very divided over what to do about public um, uh, health problems like this. And we live in a society where um, the private ownership of firearms is very prevalent and it's embedded in our culture it's uh, corporately sustained, it's constitutionally protected, and it's politically radioactive at this point. You know, fire ownerships become kind of a symbol in the culture wars. But what I'd like to do is bring evidence to bear uh, that we can try to th find our way to some solutions that on the one hand will uh, meaningfully reduce uh, this terrible problem of gun violence in our country that's uh, so sad. And, and, and at, the, at the same time, avoid simply adding to the stigma and social rejection that people with mental illnesses often feel when people assume that because they are mentally ill that they're dangerous and to be avoided. So I'm going to present some statistics today, but that's not where I'd like to start because every statistic, if it's about uh, people, human beings, uh, it boils down to a story and a, a, a person, often a person, if it's about this topic, whose life was cut short with loved ones left behind. Um, and, and each is a tragedy in its own right. And I'd like to remember that uh, as we think about these, these numbers, that these are people and these are, these are families and communities in our country. So let me start with this story right here. This is the case of Mr. T, we'll call him Mr. T. He's 41 years old. Um, he lives by himself. He's unstably employed. He has jobs now and then. He's a client of a county-based public behavioral health department, and he's been receiving counseling for a number of different problems, including agoraphobia and some anxiety and depression, and he has some excessive threat perception. He thinks people are out to get him. He's a regular marijuana user, and he, had a, he injured his back on the job, and so he was prescribed some uh, narcotic painkillers, so he has a prescription for, for those. He's been arrested one time. It's a misdemeanor drunk driving offense. And Mr. T has a lot of anger, and a lot of his anger is directed at the mental health clinic and the staff there. He just doesn't think that they're helping him, and he just uh, is very unhappy with, 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 uh, with uh, people who are, who are seeing him at the mental health clinic. And, and his family and his girlfriend, his, his erstwhile girlfriend, it's not his girlfriend anymore, are concerned about Mr. T. Well, are you concerned about him? You might be. Um, it, but, it, but if you were a, a psychiatrist or a, a uh, psychiatric social worker or a mental health counselor working in a public sector behavioral health clinic in the community, you see a lot of people like Mr. T, which in his case would not sound that unusual. But now I'd just like to add one little element, one where we put a little sticky note down at the bottom of these bullet points describing Mr. T's case. And, and it's this one. He's a gun guy. He, he frequents gun shows. He possesses a number of numerous firearms. He owns them legally. Now, are you a little bit more worried about him? Well, maybe so. But on the other hand, um, lots and lots of people own firearms in, in our country and um, don't have any, any uh, problem and, and uh, don't misuse them or have adverse outcomes. So maybe or maybe not. Well, who's Mr. T and why am I telling you about him? His, his name is Scott Harlan Thorpe. And he's actually quite well known in California, Nevada County, California, because something terrible happened. On a rainy morning uh, in 2001, Scott walked into the mental health clinic where he was uh, supposed to be seen. And he took a, a semi-automatic handgun with him and he opened fire. And a number of people lost their lives that day. And one of the people who died was Laura Wilcox, who's a, a young woman who's 19 years old. She was working there as an intern and she lost her life and it was terribly sad. Um, Laura uh, and Mr. Thorpe, um, at that point he was, he was arrested, he was charged with murder. He was found incompetent to, to stand trial. He couldn't even understand the proceedings against him. He was uh, involuntarily committed to a secure forensic facility. He was restored to competency two years later and and pleaded guilty to murder and sentenced to prison, and he remains incarcerated today. Um, Laura's parents, Nick and Amanda Wilcox, um, who are wonderful people, I've had the opportunity to, to, to meet them and to know them uh, a little bit over the years, channeled their incredible grief over their daughter's uh, loss of life and losing her 
they channeled this into advocacy, um, doing something that maybe some of you are doing. And um, this, by the way, is a picture of the Wilcoxes and, and me on the uh, lawn of the White House uh, in June of 2022, when we, were, we attended the event celebrating the passage of the Bipartisan Safer Communities Act. And we can talk about that a little bit too. Um, but they, they advocated, first of all, for a law that was named for Laura. They, they um, uh, gave their daughter's name to this law and it was California's AB 1421, Laura's law. It's California's involuntary outpatient civil commitment law, which extends the state's civil commitment authority from the hospital setting into the community and says to certain people, if they um, are at risk of, uh, of uh, not doing very well and it, with, without taking their medicine and following treatment, that they can be, have a civil court order to follow a treatment plan. And under court supervision, they're supposed to do that. It's a controversial um, law that's available in most states in one form or another, but it's, um, it's a law that people can uh, agree and disagree about it uh, with respect to whether it's too coercive or, and uh, doesn't uh, respect people's rights to make their own decisions about treatment. Um, but they, they uh, uh, were very influential in having that law uh, be enacted the year after their daughter died. And then about a decade later, they became key advocates for another law called the Gun Violence Restraining Order Law. That is now known as the uh, Red Flag Law or the Extremist Protection Order Law. And 21 states have that now. And that allows law enforcement officers with a civil court order to remove firearms from people who are in some kind of a crisis and are deemed to pose an imminent risk of harm to themselves or others. It's a civil court order. It's not criminalizing, it's temporary. And it's a, it's, a, it's a law that I think is quite promising because it has support from uh, a, a wide spectrum of, uh, of people here in the United States, even gun owners. So here are some questions to ponder. I'm not gonna answer these necessarily um, uh, right now, but I'd like you to think about that. So did mental illness cause the shooting of Laura Wilcox? I mean, was, is that the kind of master explanation for it? Um, well, Maybe, maybe not. There were a lot of other things going on besides uh, the fact that Mr. Thorpe was mentally ill. Um, and um, there are lots and lots of people who have mental illness and never do anything violent. In fact, the vast majority of people with mental illness don't do anything violent. Um, well, what about this question? Was the shooting predictable? It sure seems like it after the case. It looks like somebody should have seen this coming. And I'll tell you a secret. You know, it's quite easy to predict violent behavior and all you need is this remarkable device called a retrospectoscope. If you've got that, it's amazing what you can see through this thing, looking back in time. But ahead of time, Mr. Thorpe looked like lots of other people who'd never do that. Well, what about this? Was it preventable? Could we have prevented what we could not predict? We, pred we prevent lots of things that we can't pr predict very well. We balance the probability of a negative uh, outcome against how bad would it be if, if we were wrong and we predicted it. You know, if you're just trying to decide if you're gonna take your umbrella and, and there's 50% chance of rain, if you're wrong, well, you get wet. That's not a big deal, but would you take a 5% or 10% chance on something? And if you're wrong about it, someone would die. It might be catastrophic. So there are policies where we have to think about balancing that, uh, that equation. Do you think the shooter should have been prohibited legally from purchasing or possessing firearms. On what basis? He didn't have a felony record, which is a prohibitor now under federal law. He hadn't been involuntarily committed to a hospital. That would have prohibited him. So on what basis would we say that Scott Thorpe should not have been able to purchase the guns that he used, uh, the firearm they used in, in, in his attack? And do you think that Laura's law would have saved Laura? Well, if the purpose of that is to bring people into treatment who aren't in treatment now, he was in the clinic. That's where it happened. So maybe not. And how typical was this case? Well, I can tell you that if you look at people who, who uh, commit a mass casualty shooting and are mentally ill, they are very atypical in two ways. It, atypical of the vast majority of people with mental illnesses who are not gonna do something violent and also atypical of the perpetrators of gun crimes, most of whom do not have mental illness. But when this happens, it, it gets lots of attention. So thought experiment, think about which of these two interventions you think might have prevented uh, the tragic uh, death of Laura Wilcox. So 
what about some data here? Let, what, how would we figure out if, the, if there is a relationship between violence and mental illness uh, you know, in the population? Well, one thing you could do is you could go to a population where we already know the, 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 they're, they're violent. Let's look at people who, are in, who are, have been convicted of a violent crime and they're incarcerated. And let's go to those individuals and try to figure out how many of them have a mental illness. And the National Inmate Survey uh, has done just that. And um, the answer there, you can see prison inmates who are incarcerated for a violent crime at 16.6% have serious psychological distress. They, they meet the criteria that would be make it probable that they have a serious mental illness. Um, but the large majority do not. Uh, with respect to jail inmates, it's a little bit higher, 29.2%. So um, it isn't the case that everybody who's violent and serving uh you know, incarcerated for a violent crime is has a mental illness. That gives you one idea. Well, another thing we could do is we could look at people who have a mental illness. They're, they're clients of the public behavioral health system. In this case, we're looking at Connecticut who get arrested. And let's look at what they get arrested for. Well, here's a pie chart that, that details all of the, uh, the proportion of, of the arrests in this population, 20, 25,000 um, people with serious mental illnesses, schizophrenia or bipolar disorder. You know, 27.5% of them got arrested within a two-year period of our study. But guess what? Violent offenses, that was only 10% of them. The, the largest majority were miscellaneous minor offenses like trespassing and breaching the peace and, and um, things like that, public intoxication. So just because someone is mentally ill and they end up in the criminal legal system doesn't mean they're violent. Far from it. We could also go to a population of people who have a serious mental illness, in this case, schizophrenia, who are in, in this case, were enrolled in a randomized trial of antipsychotic medications, and let's do an assessment of how many of them are violent. So these are, this is the largest study of patients with schizophrenia ever done in the United States, uh, 57 clinical sites, and we published this paper, and, and basically 4% um, of this population of people with schizophrenia had, had done something that would count as serious violence, which is causing injury or using a weapon. Uh, another 16% had engaged in something that you call, could call minor violence, like pushing or shoving someone, uh, but it didn't cause an injury and there's no weapon involved. But 80% of these individuals with a very serious mental illness uh, did not do anything violent. Um, Another thing we could do, which is a little bit better because we're not looking at selected populations who are either selected because they're in the criminal justice system or in the mental health care system, is a community survey. And this is one that was done um, year, years ago. Uh, I was involved in this 30 years ago or so. And um, it's, you know, it's, it's uh, there are other studies that have corroborated this. I still like to cite this because um, it was kind of a landmark study. The epidemiologic catchment area survey, and this enrolled people in a in a study uh, at, at, as part of a random sample in the community. If you had a utility hookup, you could get into this. So you didn't have to be in treatment or anything else. What you see here, I'm going to cut to the bottom line here. That big gray circle represents all of the violent behavior out there, minor to serious violence. The little red wedge, four percent, that is the proportion, the population attributable risk that we could attribute to people with serious mental illness or serious mental illness as a risk factor. What that means is that if we could magically cure schizophrenia and bipolar disorder and depression, we were wildly successful with our mental health care system. And we reduced the risk of violence, not to zero, but to what it is in the rest of the population, our violence problem would go down by 4%. And the rest of it would still be there because it's caused by all kinds of other things. Some of it's demographic. Being young and male are, are, are very strong risk factors for, for violent behavior. Poverty and all of the social uh, problems and pathologies that go with extreme deprivation and sometimes living in predatory environments, that is a risk factor for violent behavior. Um, childhood maltreatment. When little children are growing up and they, and they should be establishing an attack personality and they're being abused and neglected, by the adults they should trust, that's bad. It portends bad things when people grow up. It's amazing to me that so many kids can be resilient enough to overcome that, but many do not. Exposure to violence in the environment. If you live in, a, in an environment where you see violence around you, it's a, it's a common way of resolving conflict. And that 
that increases your risk of engaging violent behavior. Impulsive anger, people have a really short fuse. Um, this is a part of their personality growing up. And drugs and alcohol is a big one. Um, so all of these things together come together. And violence is not caused by one thing. It's caused by all kinds of things that interact with each other. And it makes it difficult to predict. So with respect to mental illness, the absolute risk is about 7%. That's what, how many would do something violent, even minor violence. Relative risk is a little bit higher than that, 3.5. But 25% of people with uh, serious mental illness ha have the experience of being victims of crime. So substance use disorders, because part of that's pharmacological, dis you know, disinhibiting. Um, aggressive behavior, part of it is uh, sort of the associations that people have who engage in illicit drug use. But if we could get rid of substance abuse, violence would go down by 34%. So that's a much bigger target. It, it, you know, mental illness is not exactly the place you would start. When do we talk about violence and mental illness? Well, we, we tend to focus on it. it. It seeps into our national conversation and into our public imagination when there is a horrifying mass casualty shooting by a troubled young man, someone goes out into a public space, a church or, uh, or a school or a, a school, a, a mall and massacres strangers. And th this, this kind of event, this is the, the one that happened in Virginia Tech many years ago, which is kind of ground zero for this modern era of mass shootings. It's so, it's so disturbing, so shocking to us. It's just everything Thing we don't want ordinary life to be. We want ordinary life to be safe and predictable and to make sense. And this is none of those things. It's just so shocking and irrational that people want to know why this happened. And we get an answer. We get an answer uh, in the public square from public officials who often jump into the breach. And what do they tell us? They tell us it's mental illness. And here are just some examples. In 2017, 26 people were shot to death at a church in Texas, and President Trump said, I think mental health is your, is your problem here. This isn't a gun situation. The next year, 17 people shot to death in a high school in Florida, just, just awful. And, and Senator uh, Joni Ernst from Iowa said, the root cause is not that we have the Second Amendment, it's that we're not adequately addressing mental illness across the United States. We need to focus on that. And the year later, um, 22 people shot to death in, in a Walmart in El Paso. And Governor Abbott from Texas, um, bottom line is mental health is a large contributor to any type of violence or shooting violence. And then we have the, this one takes the cake, Ann Coulter, who's a pundit, said guns don't kill people, but mentally ill do. Well, all of these people tend to represent a uh, part of our society that's allied with the gun industry and the gun lobby. And, you know, in my view, I'll just come out and say this, I think this is partly a dodge so that we don't have to talk about the fact that we have more guns in this country than we have people. And we love guns. They are, we have domesticated guns. We, ha we celebrate guns they're, they're, and we just have so many of them. And they're largely unregulated uh, compared to other countries. So um, mentally ill, blaming mental illness and pointing to that is a convenient thing because it tends to resonate with what people already believe. About 62% of the people in the United States adults believe, according to surveys, that people with schizophrenia are very likely to engage in violence. I mean, why? Well, you know, this goes back to pre-modern times and, you know, uh, the ancient fear of uh, people possessed by, by demons who were, uh, you know, this kind of exogenous, not quite human um, you know, denizen of another reality, and we were afraid of them, and they're dangerous. And that that echoes it today in how people think about people with psychoses. Um, and so it's a convenient um, kind of scapegoat. But what do we think? What 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 can we say from actual data? Well, I'm going to just say very briefly. You have six scatter plots here, and each of those data points represents a state in the United States. And what's on the vertical axis is the firearm death rate per 100,000. And then what's on the horizontal axis is a variable. And the top three are all about mental health, like what, if, what, whether the state has a higher or lower percent of mental illness untreated, according to studies and surveys. Second one is whether what their mental health spending is per capita. Do you spend more? Maybe that, that would, you know, if, if gun violence was about mental health and you spent more per capita on it, maybe that would reduce it. The inpatient uh, psychiatric bed capacity, if we had more beds to put people in who were violent, maybe that would reduce gun violence. Well, 
I can just tell you that the correlation there is approximately zero. Those variables at the social ecological level don't explain anything. The bottom three are about firearms, uh, the state gun law restrictiveness, uh, the Brady score, the, the crime gun export rate, how easy it is to get guns so that people come across the border into your state to get guns to take them across to another state and where they recover as crime guns. And the percent of the population owning firearms. Those are all si strongly, significantly uh, related. And they explain 50% of the variance approximately. So it's not that mental illness is unimportant. It's just that, you know, fixed mental health is a, is a good slogan for a different public health problem. And um, it's not the place you'd start if you wanted to try to stop uh, gun violence, at least gun violence against other people. So just by the numbers quickly here, um, over 2.5 million people have been injured by firearms within the borders of the United States since the beginning of the 21st century, and over 750,000 of them have, have died. That's more than all of the soldiers who've perished in all of our wars. Um, and and my, a lot of people don't know this, but 59%, over half of those are suicides. 37% are homicides and the rest are law enforcement actions or unintentional shootings and gun violence of undetermined uh, uh, intent. Now that little thing on the top that looks kind of like a piece of flattened out bubble gum is the percentage of these gun deaths that relate to mental illness where the person had a known mental illness. And you can see it's about 50% of the suicides. It's a tiny fraction of the homicides. So the real story about gun violence and mental illness is about intentional self-injury. It's about suicides. And, and mental illness does play a very strong role in, in, in um, suicides and, and firearms because they're the most lethal method of suicide. That presents a big public health opportunity. Um, and we'll talk about that a little bit. Uh, gun deaths, firearm-related injury and mortality is, is not randomly distributed. Um, here you can see three variables operating across the bottom horizontal axis there, you have age, and you can see that these you have these sort of plumes that, that gun deaths uh, go up starting about the time people reach pu puberty and, and into young adulthood, and then they go down again and they kind of are level off, and then, and then they go up again at the end of life. The th four plumes at the top represent men and boys, and the ones at the bottom are, are girls and women so you can see there's a huge gender difference in gun deaths. Um, and then uh, you can see that the colors represent regions. So the South is at the top and then the Midwest and the West and then the Northeastern seats are, are lower than that. So you can see that things like the gun culture and the, and the prevalence of firearms in different regions makes a big difference in the gun death rate as well. Oh, how do we compare to other countries? Well, these are you know 14 or so. Uh, 15, I guess, uh, countries in Western Europe and Canada and Australia and Japan. And this is this compares just the overall crime rate. Um, you can see that those bars, the red ones are violent crime, and then the blue adds nonviolent crime. And you can see that just in terms of overall crime victimization, um, we're just average. We're not very high or very low. We're just right there, right above Canada and, 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 and behind Belgium. But if you take these same countries, and now we're going to display a particular type of crime, homicide, where there's a violent assault and someone dies, now you see a little bit different picture. That's the same countries. And the United States is way out there on the right. It, this looks kind of like, you know, the, the uh, um, skyline of Burlington, Vermont, with the Empire State Building stuck in there. Why is that? Well, it's because of our relationship to firearms. Guns are used in 68% of US homicides. They're used in 18% of homicides in these other countries on average. So if you break this down to a story, if you think about three uh, immature, um, uh, you know, sort of uh, intoxicated, uh, impulsive young men who get in an argument in the middle of the night in a city in Western Europe or the UK or somewhere, guess what? Maybe it escalates and someone gets a black eye or a bloody nose. In our country, it's statistically more likely that one of those young men is going to have a concealed handgun and will use it and you get a dead body, a fatality, and maybe more than that. That's baked into our homicide rates here. So how do we solve this? What do we think about it? It would be nice if we could just get a bunch of really smart, you know, passionate Methodist clergy people and others 
to, to get together, start with a blank sheet of paper or a blank computer screen and say, let's just do what works. Well, unfortunately, we can't do that. That's not where we're starting. We're starting here. We're starting with uh, the Supreme Court's interpretation of the Second Amendment of the Constitution in the landmark case of, of Heller versus DC and extended to the states in McDonald versus Chicago that established that the Second Amendment as it's interpreted protects an individual right to possess a firearm and to use that uh, for traditionally lawful purposes such as self-defense within the home. Now, now there's been a subsequent Supreme Court decision in the Bruin uh, matter that really extends that right uh, much more into the community and also puts a lot of limits on how uh, appellate courts are to interpret challenges uh, based on the Second Amendment. But, it, you know, people often forget that right in Justice Antonin Scalia's opinion in Heller, uh, the statement appears that the right is not unlimited and it explicitly preserved certain gun restrictions for people like people who had felony convictions and, and mental health adjudications like involuntary commitment, being found incompetent to proceed in a criminal matter or, or um, uh, incompetent to manage your own affairs or not guilty by reason of insanity. Those all have something to do with dangerousness. They have something to do with due process. But in my view, you know, after this, in our country, we don't really have gun control so much. We have people control because we can't broadly limit legal access to guns. We have to do something more difficult. That's to find, figure out who are the people who are so dangerous that, they, that it's justified to limit their Second Amendment right. That's very hard to do because people are complicated, violence is complicated, and the risk factors for it are all sort of nonspecific, which means they apply to many more people who are not going to do the thing that you're trying to prevent. The, the criteria that we have at the point of sale, we focused a lot, a lot of our attention on, on rules of who can buy a gun and who can't. And, you know, in other countries, sort of the default is that nobody has the right to buy a gun. And then they make exceptions on the margins for people who can make a good argument that they need to have a gun. And then it's, guns are possessed under controlled uh, circumstances. Here, it's just the opposite. The default that everybody has the right to have a gun. And we make some exceptions for people who are putatively dangerous. But we don't know who they are necessarily. And the rules that we have are too broad and too narrow at the same time. You can see these intersecting circles that they're under-inclusive and under over-inclusive. There are lots of people who are prohibited from having guns, maybe because they had an involuntary commitment 25 years ago, and now they wouldn't harm anyone. But they can't buy a gun. Meanwhile, there are a bunch of people who do pose a risk who would pass a background check because the rules are not very correlated with current risk. So I'm part of uh, a group called the Consortium for Risk-Based Firearm Policy. And we have uh, gotten together uh, after the Sandy Hook shooting and developed a set of recommendations. Some of them focus on improving the rules. Like for example, what if we had a prohibitor for people who have a misdemeanor um, uh, conviction for a violent crime? It's violence, but it's not it's not prohibitory because it's not a felony. Well, some states have done that. California is one. And guess what? Um, it, it, there's research that shows, done by my colleague, Darren Wintemute, that that significantly reduces risk of gun violence. What about if we um, had a prohibitor for people with multiple uh, uh, DUIs? Uh, there's research, and we've got a new report from our consortium on alcohol misuse and gun violence with some recommendations there. But one of the key recommendations that we came up with was called the extreme risk protection order law it's a civil restraining order i mentioned this this is the one that the wilcox has advocated for at the beginning it's not criminalizing and it allows police officers and in some states others like family members and clinicians to petition the court for firearms to be removed it's typically for 12 months and there's an initial warrant it's based on probable cause and then Within about two weeks, there's a hearing where the state has the pr uh, responsibility or the burden to prove that the person remains uh, violent. And, um, and it, it's interesting because it, this is not seen, it doesn't have to be seen as an expansion of gun control. It doesn't affect the firearm rights at all uh, for anybody who's not uh, violent and anybody who's a law-abiding gun owner, this doesn't affect them. So if people say, well, you know, I think that, um, that guns uh, don't kill people, people kill people, with, well, then this is, this is a tool that helps you figure out who those people are. And when we started this, there were only two states, Connecticut and Indiana, that had a sort of precursor version of this. Um, now it's available in 
and this map is even outdated, in 21 states in the District of Columbia, and I had the privilege of traveling to every one of these states and appearing in public forums to present our research from Connecticut and Indiana and to talk to people about this. And, you know, it's kind of the one square inch of common real estate between people who really care about gun ownership and people who really, really care about gun safety. And it's a place to start. Um, now, there is a problem, of course, when you when you poll people and you just ask them, is this a good idea? Do you think police officers should have the authority with the court order to take guns away from people that a judge says they pose an imminent risk of harming others or themselves? Everybody says yes. Then you take that and you put it into a bill in a state legislature where guns are very, very contentious. Uh, and then that's where the trouble starts. Um, it's the same with universal background checks. If we could legislate these rules on the basis of public opinion, rather than the, um, the entrenched positions of lawmakers who are beholden to the NRA, we would have a different situation. Um, our research basically found, I can tell you how, we found this, but it basically found that for every 10 to 20 of these gun removal actions, one life was saved. And you look at that and you say, well, um, one, one life was saved. Is, is that high or low? And I guess it depends on where you're standing. If you care more about the Second Amendment right than anything else, and you think that, 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 that the right to bear arms existed in the mind of God before the Constitution, you might say that's unacceptable. But if you're someone like me, and and I have, I'll just get personal here for a, for a moment. I have three gun suicide stories in my own family. One was a 19 year old cousin and one was a, a cousin in, in midlife and, and then a granddad on my wife's side of the family. And so you, I would think of it differently. And there's so many people who have, um, you know, you're not one, or two degrees of separation away from someone who's died and, and this affects your family and your community, then you might think this is, this is acceptable as a, as a trade-off of, of, between risk and rights in our country. So people ask me sometimes, well, what's the one thing we should do to stop gun violence? And I say, it's not a one thing problem and it's not a one thing solution. It's a puzzle. And there are many parts of it, many pieces. Um, and we have to keep working at putting the puzzle together over time. We have to maybe outlast out the term of office of some, um, some lawmakers who um, uh, really care more about guns than, 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 than saving lives, it seems to be. Um, so there are these social determinants of crime and violence. We need to get upstream and think about having healthier communities with fewer kids exposed to trauma who might grow up to be perpetrators. We do need to think about mental illness with respect to suicidal behavior. You know, if, if, if people attempt suicide, uh, on average, if they try anything else, they're very likely to survive. Most people survive suicide attempts, about 80 or 90%. But if they try a gun, they almost never survive. The case fatality rate is about 90%. So if you, even if you did nothing to stop the motivation for you know, the, the, the despair um, that people feel that they might wanna end their life, if you, even you didn't do anything about that, if all we did was change the methods that people had to something survivable so they would have a second chance, we, many lives would be saved. And people who survive a suicide attempt are, seldom go on to die from suicide. So the background check system, yes, we need better criteria, and we have a lot of ideas about that that we've proposed, and many states have implemented those. Many states, for example, have a temporary prohibition for someone who's detained in a short-term involuntary hold in a mental health crisis that doesn't progress to a civil commitment. Um, those things, and you know, you, you have a better opportunity to advocate for better gun safety laws at the state level um, than you do at the federal level. Um, and Although, you know, um, the Bipartisan Safer Communities Act that was passed and uh, uh, that provided $750 million to implement ERPO laws, among other things, was an example. And I, um, you know, was privileged to be a part of advocating for some of those provisions. So, uh, but what do we do about risky people who are not disqualified? I mean, 72% of the people who die of suicide with a gun in our study in Florida could have passed a background check on the day they used one to end their life. We don't have a crystal ball. So how do we think about that? All these legal issues, particularly in the aftermath of the Bruin decision that now says that 
you know, we that the thing that matters when you look at these laws, you scrutinize them, is text, history, and tradition in the Constitution. We have to try to figure out what, you know, James Madison was thinking rather than try to look at, you know, whether an AR-15 is, is, is necessary. Uh, gun technology, smart guns, the technology exists now to have guns that would only operate in the hands of their uh, rightful license owner. And a big issue is illegal, uh, Marcus. There are so many par firearms, probably 40% are purchased on the secondary illegal market. So you can have a perfect background check system if people can easily get guns without uh, going to a background check, um, then that is a, a problem. And I think, you know, culture, just gun culture, that's the purpose of a lot of public health laws. Think about the example of gun safety or of car safety laws. You know, there was a time when seatbelts were not required and the car manufacturers opposed it. Lots of people opposed it. It was passed as a law. Now, if you rode in the car today, I'll bet you put your seatbelt on and I don't even think it crossed your mind that there's a law. You do it because our culture has changed about, changed about that and it's been nudged in the right direction. And then mass shootings. I mean, this this is almost a uniquely American uh, problem of, of these angry, resentful, uh, disconnected young men um, who are marinating and hate sometimes in the social media echo chambers and and then have access to these weapons that are capable of killing people, multiple people in seconds. What do we do about that um, in our country? And these are these are increasing. Um, so, you know, I think we have to do a lot of things and keep at it. And eventually, I believe that we are going to live in a less violent society with less gun violence. I believe that. And if we get there, there's not going to be a huge, a huge headline in the New York Times that says gun violence didn't happen today. But if we got there, you know, why would that matter? Well, thank you very much for listening. And I hope we have some time for a few questions. Thank you so much, Dr. Swanson, for the presentation and all of your research and statistics to help us kind of separate um, mental health and uh, and gun violence. A um, couple of questions that came in. Um, sure. So, uh, you know, as you mentioned, a lot of the people that are watching right now um, are serving in churches as clergy, and oftentimes when uh, something violent happens within the community, people come to church looking for quite you know answers to why yeah. and what can we do um and usually in the news you know how do we counter the completion of mental illness and violence found in media and the narratives that are said by our politicians like you shared and you know is this a how do we do this as one of the ways that the church and the community can try to affect significant change in addressing problems of violence yeah, I think I think it's a uh, it's a very good question, and I've thought about it. Um, yeah, I think that communities of faith have a couple of roles to play. One is that um, they can lend their voice in advocacy um, for something like red flag laws, and and I I've seen this in many places where um, prominent voices in in the faith community have. Um, been important and not maybe they're speaking as clergy maybe they're speaking as people of faith they come come to a public forum and they talk about their values they talk about um what it means to lose people to gun violence and they're speaking from a position of being a part of a faith community and it resonates with and it something that sometimes can cut across political lines to where people are lined up <clears throat> another thing people can do I know is that churches can open their spaces for forums, for conversation, sometimes meetings of, um, of, of the local NAMI can happen in a, in a church and churches can provide a space for that kind of conversation. Um, and, um, you know, I, I, I think also that churches and um, ministry to people who have experienced the trauma of, of gun violence, suicide, for example, is another important thing that people can do because that's quite common. And I know that there are um, suicide um, grief groups and sometimes churches can play a role in that. Those are some things, but I'd be happy to listen to ideas that you have as well, because I'm always trying to listen and figure out, you know, um, rather than just being on my academic perch, 
what, um, you know, where is the right answer, wherever the right answer comes from, it doesn't matter if it's the right answer. So thank you. Thank you so much. And I'm sure that uh, you'll be getting responses from uh, some of our uh, listeners right now with some of their ideas <laughs> as well. Um, a question, and you mentioned the red flag laws, and this is a question that came in. Um, and the question is, why do red flag laws not include outpatient treatments? Yeah, I get that question a lot. Well, it's because two reasons. One is this, the, the logic of this is that it's really about risk. It's, a, it's not about mental illness per se, and the, and the legislative intent very deliberately did not include mental illness by itself as a criterion for a red flag law. So um, the second reason is that there already exists a body of law that can work in conjunction with or legal tools that can work in conjunction. I'll give you an example. Like in Connecticut, over half of the people who were uh, served with a gun removal under their risk warrant, when the police get there, they find someone in a mental health crisis. They don't just leave them there, but in over half the cases, they transported that individual to a healthcare facility for evaluation. They were admitted. And when we looked at this, <clears throat> we matched the records to the uh, Connecticut Department of Mental Health and Addiction Services. And we found that the proportion of individuals who are receiving outpatient treatment from before the gun removal till the year after doubled. It went up. Uh, and, and that is because that gun removal event and what happened around it using the other tool. Uh, and there's, there is a tool of outpatient commitment that 35 states have preventive outpatient commitment that can use, be used in conjunction with this if, that's, if the person meets the criteria. But otherwise, we wanted a versatile tool that could be applied. This could be, you know, we're worried about granddad. You know, he's bereaved. He's by himself. He's got 12 shotguns. Has he committed a crime? No. Has he made an overt threat? No, but he's bereaved. He's drinking heavily. He's depressed. Well, if you live in a state with a red flag law, you can reach out to law enforcement. They'll go investigate. They'll check it out. And they might take granddad's guns away for a while. It might save his life without having to figure out if he's a, if he's has a mental illness or needs treatment. So it's more versatile and it works with existing legal tools to get people into treatment. Thank you so much. Um, and because of time, this is actually going to be our last question. Okay. Um, what role does hyper religiosity play in violence or support for violent actions and our mental health illnesses? Well, yeah, that's a good one too. So um, in the first place, uh, psychopathology, it might be a common phenomenon in the brain, no matter where you live, but its expression um, takes the form of the culture that you're in. And so people who have, let's say, paranoid persecutory delusions, and they live in a hyper-religious environment are going to uh, probably express their psychopathology, their symptoms in those terms. Um, so that, that, that can play a role in that way. There are people who have committed mass shootings who have what sounds like hyper-religious motivation. Bigger issue though is I think that um, because of the, the confluence of politics and religion in our society now, um, People take extreme politically, I think, motivated positions on firearms in our society and gun rights, and they justify it on the basis of a religious conviction that to me doesn't sound like the gospel, <laughs> but, but it's what people say. So, I, you know, I don't want to get too far into that, but it is, it's the case if you study it now that there are people who... Um, are on sort of the right wing of the political spectrum and who also espouse a particular brand of, of religion, um, that guns have become kind of a symbol in the culture wars, you know? And so, and I think that's unfortunate. It would be nice if, if you know, people of faith could, um, could step back from that and look at the common values uh, uh, in their faith and connecting to other people's faiths that are, that are supportive of life and, um, and not uh, supportive of conflict. Um, so I know that's maybe not a great answer, but it's what I came up with. <laughs> so thank you so much. <laughs>
<laughs> thank you so much. Uh, uh, thank you again, just so much for your presentation. Um, we're going to be moving on to our next kind of part of this webinar. Um, you know, we educate to advocate. And so I'm really thankful to have my colleague, Reverend um, Kendall McBroom here to speak on how you can get involved today. Thanks so much, Kendall. Amy, just before I go, could you yes. send me please the comments in the chat? Because I, I yes. did copy them for me. Thank you so Definitely. much. Definitely. Thank you. Bye -bye. Thank you. Bye. All right. Uh, good afternoon or, or evening or morning, everyone. And, and Dr. Swanson, thank you so much for um, for a phenomenal presentation um, and just sharing deeper insight uh, regarding mental health and um, gun violence and, and violence broadly. Um, so we thank you for that and really thank you for um for the distinction and, and some of the education as it relates to uh, mental health and suicides versus uh, versus violence. Um, and so so really, thank you for that. I think one of the things that stuck out for me was uh, when you had the pie chart and you mentioned how uh, of the vi I believe it was of the violent uh, or violence enacted with uh, firearms was about 4% compared to a host of other things that um such as environment and exposure to violence and um and and again a number of of, of what we consider safety net things um and how that how that really can bring about a sense of peace and a sense of security and a sense of um of tranquility uh in in an individual's life so thank you again so much for that uh, my name is Kendall McBroom, uh, and I, uh, for those viewing or listening, uh, I serve as the Director of Civil and Human Rights. I am a 31-year-old uh, African-American male wearing a green turtleneck uh, with a beard and um, short curly hair. Uh, and it is my uh, charge and task to, after having heard uh, what Dr. Swanson has shared to uh, invite us into action, uh, into a step of action. So I want to share with you uh, two actions that you can take, um, two that my colleague, the Reverend uh, Amy, I almost called her Reverend Doctor. I don't know if I was operating again in the prophetic, but um, Reverend Camille Henderson Edwards, um, yeah. two action alerts that she has um, created um, to guide us into, again, um, action and addressing mental health illness, mental health illnesses. The first um, would be the action alert to tell Congress to strengthen mental health services. Um, as you see, the QR codes are on the screen. And so if you just take your phone and with the camera, uh, um, point it this, point it that way to the screen, it'll bring up our action alert. And the First is the Community Mental Wellness and Resilience Act, sponsored by Representative Paul Tonko, Brian Fitzpatrick, and Senator Markey, which seeks to address the compounding mental health crisis that frontline environmental justice communities face as they bear the brunt of the climate crisis. Three of the things that this bill does are it establishes a competitive grant program at the Center for Disease Control to create, operate, or expand community-based programs they use a public health approach to build mental wellness and resilience. Um, secondly, it enhances the capacity of all residents for mental wellness and resilience to prevent and heal mental health problems generated by disasters and toxic stress. Lastly, it allows community initiatives to build their own uh, developmental and culturally appropriate strategies to enhance and sustain population level mental wellness and resilience with specific attention to high risk individuals. Um, so we invite you into that action. And then our second action is uh, the betterment is leading you or, or uh, asking you to um, reach out to show your support to your senator um, for the uh, Better Mental Health Care for Americans Act. Um, and this act does, again, the following. It requires parity for mental and behavioral health services and Medicare Advantage. Medicare Part D and Medicaid. It establishes a demonstration project to increase access to integrated mental and behavioral health care 
for children across different settings like schools. And it requires the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services to develop and implement plans to better align payments, measure access and quality, and access and quality and improve prevention services for mental and behavioral health care. So those are the two actions we invite you to. I, I did see, a, um, I believe, a message in the chat about the QR code. If you're unable to access that, these are, I believe, on our webpage, um, which is umcjustice.org. Um, so we invite you to go to that page and you're able to sign uh, to sign off on those action alerts. Um, again, thank you for being with us this afternoon, morning, evening. Um, and I turn it back over to my colleague, Amy. Thanks so much, Kendall. And yes, uh, today's webinar is the fourth of six sessions of the series. And later today, you'll be receiving an email with the link uh, to this webinar and also links with uh, the action items um, and other resources that were mentioned by Dr. Swanson and other United Methodist resources and links to previous recorded webinars as well. Um, so tomorrow, oh, not tomorrow, <laughs> next week, I hope you will join us on Wednesday for our fifth webinar session on mental health and young people with Karen Howard, who is a director at Mental Health America. A sincere thank you to Dr. Swanson for being with us today and for just the amount of research and um, work that uh, you know, he's doing on uh, mental health. And thank you for joining us today. And uh, we hope to see you next week. Have a great day.